Welcome to Smoky LA. Yeah. It's uh, not looking hot out there. Oh, it's looking too hot out too there. Too hot. A little too hot. I flew into Burbank and I got off the plane. My arms, How are first, your arms? first of all, they were really tired. And really then smoky? I got off the plane and it was like, they make us walk the tarmac because it's like such a small airport. And it was like, right. you just got, <laughs> everyone started coughing. Like the whole plane just filled with smoke. Ugh. So anyway, I'm glad to be back. I'm glad since you've been back, the sky hasn't been as orange as it was. Oh, I just take so, the color out of everything. That's exactly it. You make everything a little more blue. <laughs> it was a little blue yesterday. So anyway, hi. Welcome to our, uh, this show featuring our hair accessories today. That's I right. Wanted, I wanted to jump on the cool hair wagon. Yeah. Uh, I went to buy scrunchies and I came out with this cool headband and I walked in and Emma was. I've uh, never seen that on. I've like, never that worn style. a headband before. It's very 70s. I've I think. Ne- I, I don't I don't know I the generations. Maybe. I don't either. It feels so. I'm not from this country. Or 60s. Yeah. I, uh, I've i never worn a headband before, but. It suits you. I didn't wash my hair, so I figured why not. It suits you. Thank you. Also, like, weirdly pairs well with your eyeliner. I don't know what I'm talking Thank about. Thank you. But it all, it all the puzzle is Oh, that's so uh, kind of filled. you. Well, I think you look, your hair looks voluminous as hell today. You know, here's the thing. I brought, well, I didn't actually mean to do this uh on camera i brought a hat so i could like switch out and <laughs> that's but i was like I'm, for you. I'm too lazy but it's too long it's in my hair all the time or in my eyes all the time now so i needed something to yeah give well, me a little lift now we can see your nice beautiful face you can see my my weird forehead um i hear you have things to catch me up on. well okay we have a couple of things to talk about first of all we are finally this comes out we're, we're recording this a little bit early but we are finally caught up on close friends on patreon and I wanted to yeah. say that because I know how bad we've been about keeping up. But now Em and I have in our calendar a weekly, like, update our close friends list from yes. Patreon. And so on Instagram, we're being much more uh, intentional and avid about Dutiful. it. Dutiful. People Dutiful. have also sent in some really nice suggestions of things we should do, like, yeah. for content building on there. Same. I think so, I'm doing, like, a, what? Are, did you get any good ideas? I got TikTok Tuesday since I always talk oh. about TikTok. So I will, they want me to upload like my favorite TikToks on Close Friends. That's fun. Because I don't share my account. because then you can share what you're watching. Oh, that's fun. I'm going to watch that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) What did you get? I I have been doing, some people said like Wine Wednesdays or Geo Updates, which is like so easy to do. You should do do Wine Wednesdays for sure. I'm like home alone anyway with Wine and Geo. Um, But another one was like house update or like house things. And so I was like, oh, cool. So I got to show like my on its staircase or like, you know, things, little things like that, where, um, I'm like, I don't think to post those things, but since we talk about them on the show now, you can see them on Instagram. Since your house is full of old estate, uh, estate sale haunted items. Dead people's objects. You can have that one. I don't want (laughs) to, I'm not going to copy you on that one. I'm just going to talk about the ghosts in my house. (laughs) I'll have TikTok and you can follow Christine for all the weird haunted I could just follow actual demons through my home. (laughs) Um, okay. Also, sorry, I have a couple things to mention here. Um, all very important. So close friends updated. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, we're going to release for Patreon um, A, 85 gift videos because we finally <laughs> did that. <laughs> and B, um, we're going to release on Patreon um, the, what should we call it? Space Camp. Okay, the movie. Have, that's the only update I have. Space Camp. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if we remembered. No. <laughs> Who could forget when you shoved that piece of content down my throat yesterday? So, uh, yeah. So we... Uh, we just to backtrack real quick. So we have posted a lot more gift mm-hmm. videos or gift opening videos just because we haven't been together long enough or things got in the we way. Didn't we didn't like get the mail for a long time. We haven't been able to have all of the gifts since quarantine in one spot. Like and we six finally, months worth. We got them all yesterday. Yeah. And it felt like we spent all day opening presents, which was like <laughs> which quite a Christmas experience. Yeah. It was like our birthdays. One of late. them, by the way, my hands smell like maple syrup. And I think it's because <laughs> one person gave us a um, like a homesick candle, but it was the Canada one. Mm-hmm. So whoever you are, thank you. But I found out that they use real ingredients. That's right. Because I think it, on the way to the apartment for us to open them, it melted in the car a little bit. And when we opened it up, it was like this whole like. The smell of maple syrup 
took over the entire like someone room. Someone mailed you a flapjack. And if you looked at it, maple syrup was like running around. Eva was like, guys, and like picked it up, and there was like literal liquid maple syrup <laughs> in the sides of the glass. So that's how prominent that was. So someone literally gave me a glass jar of maple syrup in, and wax. So I appreciate that you. That person gave me a lemon mug, and I used it this morning in the new oh apartment. Gosh. It's our first mug in the apartment. So it's very exciting. A so, lot of oh excitement. Oh my gosh. I arguably my favorite, which I know I probably shouldn't say, but it was hysterical and topical as we got our own corn husk dolls that's right from jen it was so perfect so thank you to, to those you. are great i think anyway a photo of them online anyway go on patreon to watch the rest of that um and the other thing that you just mentioned is uh if you remember way back in, in march the big, in march <laughs> literally like the day when uh seattle people, was canceled seattle was canceled and people started shutting down everything around the world because of covid and we were like it can't be that bad we were celebrating eva's birthday that day uh-huh. so it was like the last real happiness we had before all it's of the world of- shut down <laughs> and we threw eva a space camp party right and we filmed the whole thing and this whole time christine has been editing a video out of all of the footage we got that day because it was three people's phones for like 12 hours you'd like it was chaos you had like like 36 hours I had of footage. Like, yeah, oh, like dozens of hours of footage. Um, and somehow got it down to 40 minutes. Yeah, it's now like a feature film, but it is it, 40 minutes. And a feature film, it's like <laughs> the most insane. It's like I took absinthe before I watched <laughs> an already crazy movie. And I kept like glancing over with their hands over their mouth and was like, you're psychotic. Uh, she, I know. I think I said you're the most brilliant lunatic I've That's ever That's what met it is, brilliant life. lunatic. And I actually wear that badge proudly now. It Thank was you. a... It was the weirdest, but exactly what I expected <laughs> product. <laughs> there were like, um, I put like, I learned how to do like sports graphics just for this video. Apparently you, you bought like six different like Barcelona sports packages yep. and editing. And, and soccer and football and cricket. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing It's here. the wildest thing I've ever seen. And if you would also like to see our experience uh, during Space Camp, you can also see yeah. it on Patreon. And also so. you'll meet Xenon, who's our friend that we haven't been We've able to talk about. We've wanted to talk about Xenon for so long. That's with an X, by the way. <laughs> And two eyes with hearts and an umlaut over the O. Um, (laughs) Xenon is um, our friend and she loves frappuccinos. You'll see. She she wears falsies. She wears falsies. So sue her. Sue sue her. Yeah. You don't know what we're talking about, but if you would like to. We barely know what we're talking about. If you'd like to, please go to Patreon and uh, watch Space Camp, fall in love with Xenon as we did. Yes. And and then you'll know what the hell we're talking about. Okay. I think that's the last thing. Um, The only other thing I wanted to say is... Oh, you missed me. I missed you. Yep. Okay. That's it. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, I missed you. I did miss you a lot. But um, I wanted to also mention that uh, this is, I'm just very excited for one of my friends. His name's Alex. And he is basically the only reason I survived my job at Disney back in the day. Oh. Um, I Hi, mean, Alex. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't <laughs> Hello. Think you haven't met him. It was sort of like <laughs> pre you. Got it. And then when I he was a filler before I got here. Yeah, he kind of you kind of stepped in and pushed him off a cliff. I said, "Hi, Alex. Your time's up. (laughs) My turn." (laughs) You're so psycho. (laughs) You're a brilliant lunatic. Um. Anyway, so Alex has a podcast and he's had it for a while, and they're approaching their hundredth episode, and it's called Camp Strange. And I'm like, I'm finally getting back and caught up on my podcast, and I'd been listening to it a while ago, but I'm listening again. They did like a really good Ed Gein episode, and like recently. And they're approaching their hundredth episode. It's called Camp Strange, and it's very—it's like the same stuff we talk about, I love like it. ghosts and par- and spooky true crime stuff. Anyway, he's a good friend of mine, and I feel like we recently reconnected a little bit. So I just wanted to, to give a shout out. Yeah, give it and congrats because I remember our hundredth episode was chaotic. Just it sure was avoid confetti because that was a big problem. It was so chaotic that the people who live in your old house still have yeah. s- confetti stains that on I've, their floor. I'm for sure, not getting my security deposit back. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So that's that's my little update for the day. Um, I'm sure I'll have more in like two hours when we record the next episode. But excellent. <laughs> for now, let's talk about sure. Our let's talk about show. spooky things. Um, okay, so <clears throat> excuse wow. me. Wow, I know. Cute. Look, I don't think it's cute. I have a dairy complex. I think, and my <laughs> my throat is closing. Okay. All right. Well, it's getting cooler in Cincinnati. I know not in LA, but I don't necessarily (laughs) wear socks in the summertime. Now I'm finally wearing socks again. And thank God we have features 
Listen, Get it? It's a pun. I, Features. I, they had me at the pun. Yes. <laughs> they literally did. We were like, hell yeah. <laughs> and also, I, even though it's not cold here, uh, I am still quarantining and I love my house at a nice 50 degrees at all That's times. That's right. <laughs> so, this is true. Uh, this is true. My, my features are coming in uh, real hot. Pun intended? No? Cold? Uh, sort hot? of. Okay. Just stick with features. That's a better pun. Take me out. Okay. But no, I, okay, here's the thing though, guys. These are such comfy socks. They yes. don't, uh, like one of my big things is I usually don't wear socks that are um, above like ankle socks because I'm always afraid that they're like bunching or they're like, they slip down. Mm -hmm. These just hold on nice and tight to McAfee's and I am loving them. They make my feet feel like they're getting hugged all the time. They're very soft, but also like very sturdy. Like they don't slip, you they, know what I mean? They but they're feel still like strong, soft. but it's yeah. not like, it's not like they're like too small on me. They just fit perfectly. They've just, they've, oh, it's They've mastered the the sock hug, if you will. Well, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because features are engineered to help you achieve your best every day, whether you're working out, um, maybe not really us, but sometimes, <laughs> or if you're on the go. So they have targeted compression that acts like a hug around the arch of your foot M, which is literally what you just said. It feels and like it. It does. And it keeps the sock in place and prevents it from bunching, slipping, sliding. Um, it's like the, each uh, sock has a left and a right. So like they are literally designed to fit your feet perfectly. Um, Can and confirm. they're so durable and long lasting that they have a lifetime guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied at any point, they will give you a replacement pair with no questions. And trust me, you will, you will not want a replacement. You know, I don't know if this is necessarily what their, like what their intent is, but I'll tell you, it's been an additional bonus for me is that my feet at the end of the day get so, so sore. I have like terrible feet problems. And because I've got this compression, uh, this, these compression like hugs, I'm just going to call them hugs. I, my, <laughs> I just feel like I'm getting a nice little massage on my feet. Like they're just like being held perfectly and cradled as I lull myself to sleep. Anyway, they're, this is how we talk about our feet. Don't worry about it. It's normal. My feet are being lulled and yours can too. CY features has quickly become the number one running sock in America for listeners of, for listeners of, and that's why we drink you can receive $10 off your first pair of features by going to features.com and using our code drink. That's $10 off your first pair when you go to F E E T U R E S dot com and enter promo code drink at checkout. Again, that's features.com and use our code drink to get $10 off your first pair of features. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores, offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, and contact lenses. Yeah, uh, I have several pairs, um, and that's because they are also super affordable. They start at $95, include, $95, including prescription lenses, and they also have sunglasses, progressives, and blue light lenses, and I'm wearing one of my many pairs right now. You um, frame, and I just said this uh, like two seconds ago, but your eyes are perfectly <laughs> framed. You got a nice frame, Thank you. frame set of and eyes there. Yeah, I'm always complimenting you when I wear my Warby Parkers, so I try to wear them as often as possible. I do. I've um, been using this word a lot, but you look very sharp in them. Oh, Very, thank you so much. Yeah, you like, I mean, I already knew you were like a Ravenclaw, but you're like really like <laughs> upping the intelligence game visually with your wow. Warby Parker. What you do is you take a quiz, you order this home try-on kit, and then they give you five pairs and you have you have time to like wear them all and test them out. And so as M knows, and probably all of you know, I love a good quiz. Pairs, <laughs> love a good quiz. And I did a fun little poll on Instagram where I was like, which ones do you like better to the audience, to the audience, to our our listeners <laughs> and uh they they all had differing opinions so i just bought several pairs <laughs> you like, make everybody happy you know what you're right i should have all five okay <laughs> they're all it. great <laughs> uh try warby parker's free home try on program order five pairs of glasses to try on at home for free for five days and there's no obligation to buy it ships free and includes a prepaid return shipping label try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash drink <laughs> So my first story, I had not heard of this. I'm very excited about it. Oh, um, and oh, oh God. Trey Songs is that he? He follows Did you, you come here? to work with me? Bring your neighbor to work day. Okay. okay. P.S. I slept in the apartment last night. I was telling <clears throat> M for the first time by myself at like the and that's where I drink apartment. And I, uh, we had always slept in the living room, even though there is like literally a bedroom. But so two bedrooms. Yeah. So I dragged the <laughs> air mattress into the bedroom and like slept in there. And I was so freaked out because there were so many noises, you know, when you're in a new apartment and it's, by the way, empty, basically. It's just boxes. So there's like so much clanging and like pipes and the people upstairs. And um, 
I had to put like our uh, armadillo doorstop that someone gave us in Texas, like against the bedroom door in case someone broke in, like that would stop them, I guess. I don't know. And um, <clears throat> anyway, so I feel like I woke up every hour from like a clanging. So my nerves are fried. My favorite part of this weekend with uh, Christine is the fact that she stopped by my apartment and asked if she could borrow the company card. <laughs> Because she needed snacks at the apartment. And so then like two hours later, I go to the apartment oh, no. expecting like some snacks on the counter. And, and instead were... I found a Keurig, a mm -hmm. bed frame and a 40 inch TV. <laughs> well, they were all business expenses. <laughs> and then we're sitting there and the, I like walked to the door and I was like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, nothing. And, and I you're like, oh, it. I also got some Oreos. And there were just like boxes from Amazon. And I was like, oh, I ordered a Keurig. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Give me that fucking Listen, card back. Listen, if I'm going to be living in this place, I need <clears throat> coffee. Someone already mailed me a lemon mug. You're right. You're right. You're right. And I've been sleeping on an air mattress and I'm almost 30. I'm too old for this. My back <laughs> fucking hurts. I needed to order a mattress on Amazon. So, so sue me. I understand. It was very funny though, where I was like, didn't you want a snack? <laughs> you literally walked in there like one box of goldfish and then like a television. <laughs> and I walked in, there was like a couch set up. There was a whole fucking television. Okay. Anyway, back to sorry, the story. Sorry, sorry, no, sorry. No, you're good. So this is, uh, this is apparently America's first documented ghost. What? I feel like I've covered a topic somewhat like this at some point. I, f I must have covered like an America's first ghost, right? I maybe not. Like maybe not. It seems like you would have. Apparently not this time, not in this way. Okay. So, uh, this is the story of Nellie Butler. Nellie Butler. I don't think I know that name. I feel like the name Nellie should come back. It's a cute name. I, I have like a cousin it. named Nellie. That's fun. A step cousin. Yeah. And she's, she's like very cute. She like embodies that name. Nellie. I don't think I've ever met anyone named Nellie. I have a cousin named Melly, like Melanie. Huh. I mean, we, we, I'm maybe, she, I guarantee her friends don't call her Melly, but growing up, that's what we called her. Yeah. I think Nellie, my step cousin, that's like her full name, I think. Hmm. Anyway. I, have, I know an Ellie. Okay, let's just stop. That's, we're just we're coming hey, up with rhymes now. I know a Billy. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost there. Um, okay, so this is the first ever documented ghost in America. This was in Franklin, Maine. And Nellie Butler, uh, her parents were David and Joanna Hooper. Um, and this was in the late 18th century. Okay. So, so there were no ghosts before then. Apparently not. <laughs> like That's no I'm, ghosts I don't understand. Maybe... <laughs> So, okay, that's a fantastic point. It's because not like anyone lived in this country before, you know, As America, someone who was an investigator in Virginia, I've spoken to a lot of ghosts from the 1600s. So you're on to something. So you're about to do like an expose on this. <laughs> Wait a minute. On this BS. Calling you out, Nellie. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, this is, I, it says the first documented. So maybe this is just the first one that was written up in papers I mean, or something. We're the first podcast like ever. So I guess. Uh -huh. Yeah. I get her point. You, you know what? That was the most uh, sane thing you've ever said. Thank you. I'm a brilliant lunatic. <laughs> so Nellie Butler's dad, uh, David, he fought in the American Revolutionary War. Um, and then afterwards, he started a business with his wife. Um, and they had nine children in nine years. Holy shit. Ooh, like, ouch. It's like competing with the Duggars. <laughs> this is actually the first documented Duggar case. I forgot. The first say. Duggar family. And uh, in 1776, Nellie was born. Um, she was the second oldest daughter, apparently. So in, uh, 19, in 1795, when Nellie was 19, she met George Butler, who was a sea captain. Um, his father's name was Moses and we're going to get back to him in a little bit. Okay. Um, also never met anyone named Moses. Me neither. Um, I just maybe haven't met a lot of people. Um, <laughs> we're pretty, uh, antisocial, <laughs> so that might be the problem. So, uh, the Butlers were one of the first English settlers in the area. Um, Nellie and George ended up getting married and they lived in Franklin. Um, they got pregnant and Nellie had a baby and unfortunately her and the baby both died during childbirth. <gasps> no. Um, so she is buried, uh, in the same area in an unmarked grave. And, uh, in 1785, uh, so this is a little backstory to someone else. So in 17. 95, Nellie was 19, mm -hmm. married George, blah, blah, blah. 10 years before that, there was another girl named Lydia. Okay. Um, also a nice name. Also a nice name. Lydia Chlamydia. That's right. I was uh, like, why does that so familiar? And uh, You've met a Lydia. <clears throat> so Lydia was born, and this is where their stories merge. So when Lydia was 15, she had a, a disease that they did not actually outrightly name. So she was sick. Um, and she was dying. She was laying in bed and she had her 
first encounter with Nellie, <gasps> who had died two years before. <gasps> oh, shit. So, like, on her deathbed, she yeah. sees the ghost of Nellie. She's like, hey, me too. Like, hey, girl. Hey, what's up? <laughs> We're closer than ever Aww. in veil wise. Um, <laughs> veil wise. So while in bed, Lydia was hearing knocking from the cellar. She told her family about it, but they couldn't hear anything. Um, the family went to investigate, but they didn't see anything. And so eventually Lydia's dad, Abner, I'm going to say not a cute name. Abner. I just think of little Abner, like the from what? Hey Arnold's, the little pig. I was like, isn't that a pig? <laughs> I was going to say from a classic novel, but no, like literally from Hey Arnold. Is it from Charlotte's Web? Is that the pig also? Maybe. Listen, the last time I read Charlotte's Web, I was a child. Um, you don't read it every weekend like I maybe do. Maybe Abner's just the name of all pigs. Is that true? Oh, it could be. Could be. Um, okay, so she heard knocking. Her family didn't believe her. The family didn't see anything in the basement. So Abner, Lydia's dad... Uh, <clears throat> made the family pray to make sure that the sounds were not coming from hell. <laughs> it's oh, like, that's nice. Let's pray that they're from heaven <laughs> okay. or a prank. And uh, basically a few days later, the whole family started hearing the knocking and they also started hearing the voice of a woman. Okay. And th- apparently the first thing that they all heard together was, I'm the dead wife of Captain George Butler, born Nellie Hooper. So yeah. like very, wow, very eloquent. detailed. Yeah, very, very well spoken. I officially know everything I need. Also love that before the name, we we learn her, her, her standing as wife of blank. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also appreciate that uh, if they were to use a Ouija board, those are like, Two of the Tyler first things I would have wanted to know. Forever though. Yeah. I am like it would take forever. We would be way too impatient. We'd get like four letters in and go, that means nothing. Maybe she sensed they'd be impatient and was like, I'm just gonna tell you now. I'm just gonna yell it from the cellar. So the family found uh nothing in the cellar again, but they kept hearing the woman's voice throughout the month. And eventually they started seeing the figure of a woman wearing a white dress, and she was always in the cellar and in the nearby field. So that is just okay. where they always found the dead wife of Captain George Butler. Great. Born Nellie Hooper. Right. <laughs> um, two months later, uh, she began to talk to them directly, like would approach them herself <gasps> oh, from no. the cellar or the field and speak to them that way. Oh, no. Um, she said, again, she was Nellie Butler and she'd been dead for a few years. Great introduction. Mm-hmm. Um, and she said that she was going to their house because remember, these are it's like a totally random family. Like, why are they dealing with oh so this wasn't even her house Mm -mm, no oh i thought they would like moved into her old house or something no it was like nelly and george got married and then nelly died and then elsewhere like in a couple towns over lydia's she's like i I guess i like this field and this basement (laughs) it's a sharp field okay um but yeah so i guess at some point they were like why did you pick us to never leave (laughs) and how nice of you uh nelly basically said well i know that lydia and George have been dating. <gasps> what a little petty, biatch. petty, petty. She's really just calling them out. To be fair, that's what I do. If I die, I know it is. I know it precisely. <laughs> if that I it's died what you do. and then Allison started dating someone, I'd definitely go knock on that guy's door and be like, um, what's up? She's like, <laughs> she's what like, are you doing? I know. It's like, oh, look, now I'm going to haunt you. You think forever. I don't see you? Yeah. Yeah. I'd be like, I'm, I know too well what's I'm happening. I'm watching you from the cellar. <laughs> I'm in your cellar permanently, so don't think you're going to get I'm away with this. And I'm the wife of. Now it makes a lot of sense why she's like, by the way, I'm oh, the wife of blank. That makes so much George. sense. It's like, you'll know exactly who I am before I even say my name. Oh, my God. So uh, here's the creepy part. Lydia was 15. George was 29. Uh-oh. Even back then, apparently, that was odd. Um, even back then. You know how, like, some, like the age gap didn't yeah, like, matter like it I'm does 29. today? Can you imagine if I was dating a fucking 15? A sophomore First of in high school? All, I would that sounds like your sister literal hell yeah but that's like literally my <laughs> sister's age yeah oh boy <sighs> okay um so basically she said i found out that you're out interested in each other or talking to each other or i think the early signs of courtship were there okay um again duggers anyway i can shove them in a conversation i will yeah i know um poor you i do feel bad for you sometimes that you're we're friends um, I also feel bad for myself. I don't feel bad enough to do anything about it. <laughs> to <but> change it. <laughs> sometimes I'm talking and I'm like, 
I feel bad for what's happening right now, but it's not going to stop. I mean, I show up with the literal televisions after I told Jeremy to buy Oreos. So I think like <laughs> we're even. I'm going to call it even from the time I literally showed up at your doorstep and said, I need $500 in cash. That's true. And you just gave it to I me. I had friends over too. And I was I like. <laughs> you had a party I wasn't invited to. It wasn't a party. I had three Nickelodeon coworkers because we had homework to do. And so we were watching. Looked a lot like a party. We, we were, were watching having, Jaws. We were and having too much fun with your homework. I was having so much fun that I walked outside and gave you $500. That's how much fun my party was. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> Where did I get five hundred dollars? Okay, that's besides the point. Anyway, let's go. You're uh, my best friend. There's, there's nobody. I better be at this point. There's nobody else. I'm I trying could, really hard. I hope you feel safe in our relationship. <laughs> that you're the only person I thought to go to. You drove from like fucking Pasadena. Pasadena to my house for five hundred dollars, and I was like, okay. Um, I was like, you want to watch Jaws? You were like, no, I don't. I was like, well, you gave me five hundred dollars, so I should stick around. I'm gonna leave. <laughs> Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. So yeah, they're dating and there's an age gap and Abner, Lydia's dad is not happy about it either. Um, and basically Nellie lectured Lydia and the family, um, on quote, the reality of the afterlife and then complained that when she revealed herself to the family originally, I guess Lydia has a brother. She revealed herself to Lydia's brother and he apparently was very rude by not speaking to her. What a little jerk. So he, she like held this grudge that she, a ghost, approached someone and then that guy was probably freaked out and didn't talk to her. And, and now like, I'm just going to close my eyes. Right. Which makes me think, how many ghosts have I pissed off because I didn't interact probably with them a lot. when I was just scared? They're like, they talk to everybody else on this planet and they're not going <laughs> to talk to me. That's why um, they launch your Starbucks <clears throat> off the counter. Well, so I guess for a while she didn't, there was a gap bef- from when she was originally showing up and then... She was gone for like a month and then she came back and started talking to people. So like remember she was just she doing the knocking. Stay away. Right. And then eventually she started talking. That gap was because she was insulted that <laughs> God, the brother didn't really reach is, out. Uh, a lot. And then she came back swinging and she started opening her mouth and chatting. <laughs> okay. Um so Nellie said that she had greater plans that would require the belief of more people. So let's remember that. Okay. And Nellie spoke to Abner, where uh, even Abner said that her voice uh, flitted around the cellar from corner to corner. Um, Nellie wanted to encourage George and Lydia's relationship. Like, came back the exact opposite of what I would do if Allison were dating someone. Yeah. Um, She wanted to encourage George and Lydia's relationship and ordered Abner, Lydia's dad, that it must happen and it was their, quote, divine mission whoa Um, okay this is becoming troubling very quickly then she said quote what god hath joined together let no man put asunder yeah which is like what you say in a wedding asunder asunder yeah that word's gonna be at my wedding no no why would no you're not getting (laughs) married in the catholic church are you (laughs) Uh, maybe i want to spice things up okay so uh now it's 1800 um and nelly is still in their cellar demanding that Lydia and George take their relationship more seriously. What? Um, That's so creepy. And she she said that they need to visit George's father. This gets real desperate housewives real quick because you have to remember a lot of people and none of them are directly related to each other. Okay. So, like, she wants to go to her ex-father-in-law's Got it. house with her husband's new girlfriend and her father. So, like keep George himself out of the picture and this everyone is else is going to go to this sure guy's dad. you as a ghost. You're like, okay, let's see what I can <laughs> conjure up here. Let's see what drama I can watch and create. That's exactly it. So uh, they, she said, uh, bec- I guess Abner, because he was so hesitant about allowing Lydia and George to continue talking to each other. Nellie was like, well, let's go to George's dad and see what he has to say. And you guys can like negotiate. And so they go to George's father's house and then she says that the two need to get married and then said a verse from Mark 10. Okay. um, Which, interestingly, is the section titled Divorced. Oh. Um, The section? The the one section in Mark 10 is titled Divorce, and it's uh, where Jesus says that the two people that marry, the two will become one flesh and all that. Don't asunder it. Asunder, a word I just learned today. (laughs) Um. Therefore, what God joined together, let no one separate and anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. That was the quote. So it's like, okay, so in a way you're like, your husband is 
cheating on you because well, no, he's marrying another woman. Because she died. Oh, right. And if you're a widower, you death. have to yeah. remarry in the Bible, I'm pretty sure. Mm. If you are divorced or you can't get divorced is basically the idea. Don't do it because then you're a big cheating bastard. Fascinating. Isn't it wild? Yes. I kind of just want to read the, the Bible and like treat it like, like an, an action packed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like certain parts. Yeah. But then like, it's okay, real just Mark dry. 10. Just the, no, no, just no, also divorce. revelations. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. We'll do a little Bible study. Where I'm we just, just jaw read, like, dropped the whole time. Pages. <laughs> so uh, Abner and Lydia left to go deliver this message of this part from Mark 10 um, they were there during a snowstorm and they like crossed a river that was frozen. It was a very dangerous travel. Um, and while they were getting to George's dad's house, Lydia began to think about marriage and realized that she wasn't like actually that interested in George and like didn't oh. want to totally marry him. She's like, I thought it was fun when no one, when it was secret and no one wanted me to do it. When I wasn't peer pressured by his dead wife's ghost. <laughs> um, and so apparently Nellie could sense her doubts and appeared to Lydia and oh then God. like apparently made the travel a lot easier for them to get there. Uh, like to be like, no, no, no. Like cleared I'll, the road. Yeah. Like tried to like help it be less taxing of a, of a journey. What? Like helped like push the cart and everything. So it moved faster. And so it's a weird ghost. This Nellie's very Nellie dead set on this. Dead down. set. Um, so Abner and Lydia eventually got to Moses, George's dad's house. Mm-hmm. Um, who was also against the marriage. So Abner and Moses were like, no, neither of us want our children to get married. Um, But Abner said that this was Nellie's like last request from beyond the grave. And even though Moses said uh, like he wasn't interested, he did wonder like, why would this random couple, why, why would this like daughter that I haven't even met yet and her father show up in like the worst weather conditions and like, Requ- like make this like wild claim unless they were serious or my thought would have been like cuckoo. yeah my thought would have been like they're wackadoos yeah wackadoo indeed um <clears throat> so that being said he like it kind of opened him up to like okay maybe oh boy we should take this seriously are way too easily convinced they also decide that to like kill two birds with one stone they're like while we're in this town let's also go to david hooper's nelly's dad Oh, and uh, they're like, let's just go to everyone's fucking dad and like, get a bunch what of permission. A weird road trip. Um, so they decided that they were going to invite George. They're like, look, we already talked to your dad. You're also welcome. Join so us. <laughs> basically, they were like inviting everyone to come to their house and see Nelly for themselves, and be like, okay, if you come here, Nelly will definitely show up. She wants to shut up in our house. Like, she'll definitely be there if you want to go up. talk to her. So they invited. George's dad, George. They also invited David Hooper, who mm-hmm. was Nellie's dad. Um, so they invite everyone over. And then David, who's Nellie's dad, Lydia, who's Nellie's ex's ex, and Abner, who's Nellie's ex's ex's dad. <laughs> they all get okay. in the cellar together. Okay. They start talking to Nellie. And uh, basically Nellie's dad was convinced immediately this was his daughter that he was talking to. Oh, really? Well, okay. Um, this is a quote from Nellie's dad. By the request of the specter sent by two messengers, I went to Abner Blydell's house and by converse and by conversing with he obtained such clear and irresistible tokens of her being the spirit of my own daughter as gave me no less satisfaction than admiration and delight. She gave a reason satisfactory to me why she put me to the trouble of coming here there instead of me coming to my own house. Um, and then George showed up later that night and said, uh, when I was called to talk to this voice, I asked, who are you? And it answered, I was once your wife. Oh, well. Uh, I like how it was so, cl- like, if Allison were like, who are you? I'd be like, it's me. Like, what the what fuck are you talking about? question is that? You better know. You're wasting my energy with that question? Yeah. <laughs> I was once. Okay. That's not how that would go. Um, mm-hmm. the vo- and then George keeps saying, the voice asked me, do you remember what I told you when I was alive? I answered, I do not really know what you mean. The voice said, do you remember I told you I did not think I should live long with you? I told you that if you were to leave me, I should never wish to change my condition, but that if I was to leave you, I could not blame you if you did. What? Why? why, First of all, what a... That's a lot of words. That's a lot of words. And also, it doesn't sound... I don't think I would have... If I understood what was going on, I don't think I'd like it. (laughs) (laughs) So is it bad news? Is that what we're hearing? It sounds like she just always knew she wasn't going to live long or yeah. she wasn't going to be with him for very long. 
George keeps saying, this passed between me and my first wife while she was alive, and there was no living person within hearing, and but she and myself, and I'm sure that this, it's very long. Basically, he's saying that was a conversation so they did have. So she would have, have only known that yes. if she were actually her. They were the only two people in the room when they had that conversation when she was alive, so for this voice to be saying it. Uh-huh. So I'm he's developing a, a theory here, but anyway. I'm thinking it's Jeff the Talking Mongoose this whole goddamn time. <laughs> and also, I'm so proud. He would, he would. He would show up and be like, I'm bored. What can I do? <laughs> I, uh... I'm so primed at this point that every time I read a ghost story, I'm like, when does Harry Price get here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I need him to like do some experiments. Christine, you're looking, you're looking dewier than ever. Perfect skin, perfect eyes, perfect lips. What are you doing with yourself? Oh, listen, I even have new lip color. Okay, it's all Glossier's fault. I want to say, I want to say fault, but <laughs> really I'm you. very thankful to them. <laughs> um, so you all probably know Glossier for their skincare products and for popularizing my glowy, I mean, everyone's glowy, dewy skin. Uh, <laughs> but they also create makeup products, body care and fragrance. Um, I've been using this boy brow. I mean, when I was younger, I kind of screwed up my eyebrows, didn't we all? Who and now didn't? They, I know. And now they <laughs> sent this boy brow product and it like makes your brows look really natural. It has like a little wand and it stays all day. I, I'm obsessed with you it. You know what's anyway. so funny? I found uh, the boy brow on uh, Allison's vanity and I was like, what on earth is this? And she already, <laughs> by the way, has a, she has so many other products that she used to use. <laughs> and the second that Glossier came in, she was like, no, never mind. I'm never just, mind. It's the boy brow and my dewy skin. And that's that. <laughs> it's amazing. So the brow product, if you're wondering, so it's a best-selling grooming pomade for instantly fluffy full brows, which we all love and are very in right now. And they have subtly tinted shades. So they have blonde, brown, black, and they even have auburn and clear. And I've tried the clear as well. If you're looking for like a more natural look, it doesn't leave a trace. Uh, and it a, has a brushable creamy formula that visibly thickens and shapes your brows into place and you don't have to worry about it. It's like sort of like mustache wax. Um, you know what I mean? I, you know what? I certainly know exactly what that is. <laughs> I totally know. <laughs> also, I know we've just been talking about boy brow, but it is their bestseller. There's more than 3 million, more than 3 million of them have been sold. Um, and for good reason, only a few swipes give you a soft conditioning hold for fluffy, healthy looking face framing brows, as you can see on Christine's delightful face. If you're on YouTube beautiful, right now, beautiful. If uh, I do say so myself <laughs> <laughs> and they're perfectly portable. So you can basically carry your eyebrows in your pocket. And I do. Uh, get Boy Brow by visiting glossier.com slash podcast slash drink. All new customers will get 10% off their first order on glossier.com slash podcast slash drink. Certain exclusions apply. That's G-L-O-S-S-I-E-R dot com slash podcast slash drink. And so George's friend also confirmed that uh, George uh, saw Nellie's apparition and George's hand actually passed through her. <laughs> So that's a whole other <laughs> random person believing. Okay. Nellie's dad went to George's dad. Oh my God. This is so fucking confusing. To confirm that Nellie spoke to him and uh, basically George's dad agreed like, okay, like I've seen her. I'm convinced that like you really got this request from her. I'm convinced that she sent you to us. If she really means it and has this divine mission that I don't really understand but she brought you into my life, then yes, I think I our children should blessing. get married. Yeah. So I think that this is my I, son and your mm, daughter should get together. Mm, mm, mm. Um, <clears throat> so that being said, he gave his blessing. Abner, Lydia's dad, gave his blessing. And so even though neither of them were thrilled, <laughs> they set a date. And with the news of the marriage, plus the sightings of Abner and Lydia always hanging out with George's family and gossip about a ghost at their house, um, the tea was hot. Yeah, as sounds the, like it. As the folks would say. Yeah, the youths. The youth. Um, and so these were some of the theories going on, or these were some of the questions that people in town were asking. They were asking, was this one big ruse by Lydia just to get with George? Um, but then again, Lydia was saying she wasn't really like... Okay, but I think I have a theory about that, what's too. What's your theory? My theory is that Lydia was doing pulling this off, and then when it got too far, she was like, okay, never mind. I'm uh -huh. changing my mind. Or she's 15 and was like, okay, never mind. I actually changed my mind. <laughs> she's like, but I'm then, 15. <laughs> by then, her parents were like, oh, no, this is real. And she's like, shit, I'm too far deep in this. Okay, so or it was the guy, the creepy 30-year-old, yeah, who was like, 
No, my it's dead wife definitely wants my this. wife. She it's her dying wish. She never would have known that. You know, yeah. It's I bet you it's one of these. So okay, creepers. so those two theories, valid theories. Well, thanks. Um, some people also thought maybe this was witchcraft from Lydia. They thought okay. like maybe she had conjured the spirit, like hexed it somehow. Yeah. Um, and they but they said like well she was before Nelly got here she was really sick and like miraculously mm. was fine now so they thought maybe witchcraft was involved like with that. We've heard so many stories where teenage girls get bored and then start like throwing their voices and right. like tr tricking their families. But people could see Lydia. Like mm -hmm. they could see like a woman that looked exactly like her in a white dress that you could like put your hand through. Okay. And later apparent I'll, I'll, I was going to bring this up later but apparently Many people confirmed that the way that they would see her is when you first walked into a room and she like, or walked into the cellar and she was there. Apparently she started out really tiny, like a borrower. Oh my God, what? And then as time went on, she grew to life size. Maybe it's like a projector thing. Maybe. In 1800 though, were there projectors? I mean, probably not. I don't know. Maybe it was a mirror and the light. May or maybe she's just really small. Or maybe okay? she's a borrower. I get it. I don't know. <laughs> maybe she's one of those sponges you put in the water. Oh! And it grows to a 100 times its size. dino egg. Um, but yeah, so that was also weird. I was like, that's a new one. I've never yeah, heard that before. it's a little fishy to me, but... So some people think it was one of your theories. Um, some people think it was witchcraft. Some people think Nellie's ghost is just Lydia's voice being thrown. Mm -hmm. um, some people... Oh, and one of them was... So Nellie's sister, Sally, didn't like at first believe that this ex was true. Sure. Like, Oh, my sister is haunting that space specifically. And so she even kind of spread around the theory that maybe it was supernatural, but it was a demon posing. Well. <gasps> um, yeah. Being like, I think this child should marry this grown adult. Right. Well, a lot of people started saying like this, if it's real, it must be demonic. Yeah, like and so that's why apparently later on, Nellie gets more and more religious whenever she talks and so people think that that was either the demon trying to prove to She's everyone like compensating like, bingo Ew. or that it was it was actually Nellie and she was like I'm not the work of a demon look I'll say a bunch of bible shit like, uh. like but either way it got weirdly more religious Creepy. as time went on um oh my god so Sally Nellie's sister went to go visit the house it's interesting like every it's almost like a like a sideshow like you have to go to their house see that's the other thing that's fishy to me is like the dad was like oh she explained why she couldn't come to our house yeah like what why and a lot of people if you wanted to talk to her you had to go to their house so Sally Nellie's sister went to their house and to wait talk for to her, her to grow for a little peanut waited for her little spongy sister to just <laughs> grow on up um and Sally said she heard the sound of knocking and then, quote, Lydia spoke and a voice answered the sound, which also sounds a little Harry Pricey of like you go into a seance room and like there's a, mm -hmm. a routine here where someone I think knocks. he would have debunked this. I think I so, really too. do. Um, a voice answered and the sound of what brought fresh to my mind my sister's own voice in an instant uh, appeared, but I could not understand it at all. It was within the compass of my embrace and it had been a creature which breathed, but... <clears throat> Uh, it would have breathed in my face. So she's hearing voices, but it, and it's close enough to her that she should have felt breath on her. I see. But she's not feeling breath on her. I passed through the room, which led to the cellar and uh, into another room, and there I was much surprised when I plainly understood by the same kind of voice still speaking in the cellar these words, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. From this time, I cleared Lydia as the That's voice. A Bible to verse. Well, she said from this time, uh, I cleared Lydia as the voice and accused it was the devil <gasps> because she was like, Lydia was with me. I should have felt breath on me and I didn't. I could still hear the voice in the cellar. It was not Lydia because Lydia was with me. And so she assumed it was the devil. She's like, there's only one answer. <laughs> it's the devil. At that point, I'd be like, thank God I'm not in the cellar it's with her. It's not you. Like, it's not Lydia. It's the devil. So uh, her sister went on. Uh, to say, like, no, it was the devil and believe this until Sally herself died. Whoa. Um, she claimed that the voice sounded so much like Nellie that there's no way it could have been replicated by someone Ugh. unless it was a demon trying to trick someone. Because you know how there's a lot of stories where, like, the demon <clears throat> yeah. will sound like someone you love? Uh, do you think demons can quote the Bible? I feel like they're, like, allergic to it. That's a good question. You know I, mean? I would also, maybe if you're, like, powerful enough in, like, doing Ugh. it purely with the intent of manipulation oh you're like you know yeah i get it maybe i don't know i don't want to know i'm happy not knowing. i want to know somebody so, tell demons get at me so they basically this 
poor family, if Nellie's real or the devil is real. Um, the family kept living in this house with Nellie talking to them every fucking day. Um, apparently she would wear a white dress, wearing a cap sometimes, um, and sometimes holding and cradling the body of her dead baby. <gasps> so it, it goes from cute to not cute real quick. Yeah. Um, Oh, sorry. When was it cute? Just wearing a, a little cap with a white dress. And then she's like holding a dead baby. So yeah, okay. I, I listen, I wasn't really charmed by this creature so far, but so Nellie would usually appear in the form here. It is no bigger than that of a toad and would over time grow <laughs> to normal height. Um, what? she so was weird. apparently for a spirit. She was very polite and she only ever stayed in the cellar because she didn't want to interrupt their daily living Bull upstairs. Shit. Bullshit. She's or, like screaming from the cellar, like, I don't want to bother you, but I'm going to keep talking until someone <laughs> pays attention to me. Then I'm going to push your wagon down the street. It's like, I'm not going to go upstairs and bother you, but I will bother you from down here until you Didn't come she, talk like, to me. Didn't she come to the house with them like to and like push the wagon there? Yeah, apparently she can leave. She was also in a field at one point. So Listen, I don't believe this chick for one second. Sometimes Nellie would get bored and she was seen walking around town. Oh, let's see, But she wouldn't speak to anybody. People just saw her around town. Um, and a woman named Mary Gordon once visited the house to encounter Nellie. And she said, at first, the apparition was a mere mass of light and then grew into a personal form about as tall as myself. We stood in two ranks about four or five feet apart. And between these ranks, she grew into a person uh, or she slowly passed and repassed, um, so that any of us could have handled her when she passed by me. Her nearness was that of. I can't understand old people talk. It's like also, it's so beautiful, but I don't get it. Uh, I, I certainly should have felt her, but I didn't. The glow of the apparition had a constant tremulous motion. Tremulous. Like shaking. So they're seeing her. They should be able to feel her. They can't. So I am convinced now I have a new theory. I think this is like a, a distant cousin or someone who came to visit and they're trying, the family looks like is her. pulling this prank. Yeah. Or the mom is pulling it. Somebody who wants the kid to marry this weird dude. And I is, guess so. I mean, it's you're there's no way of know. knowing if you're right or wrong, but like also maybe like, they had a light and they would shine it really strong and she would walk out of a curtain oh. or some shit. Like, I don't know. I'm like, this is, this is a little too, physical for my liking i, I agree all these people are seeing this apparition i think it's phony well so by so anyway it i don't know what to tell you man i don't either <laughs> so lydia was uh also routinely telling people if they got near her to fear not which sounds like something uh yeah demon right. would say. <laughs> if you're saying fear not you probably are I'm, hoping I'm people already are afraid. afraid right um so by the time Lydia and George actually got married, because even though she didn't really want to do it, she like stuck it out because obviously Nellie oh, was God, pressuring that's her. that's so fucked up. So by the time of their wedding, news of Nellie had spread to other towns and people were coming to witness her. Mm -hmm. And so they would go to the Blydell's house and talk for hours. So it seems, again, like a paid attraction. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, Lydia wasn't looking forward to marrying George oh, and she God. actually had plans to run away before the this marriage. poor child. It's a literal child. Um, and the family, I guess they had family in New York. So she was like, or not New York, maybe no New York. Um, so she had family there. So she thought, okay, well, if I leave before the wedding, I can just go live, stay with them. Um, and basically Nellie confronted Lydia and said that you have to do this or no. her afflictions would sail with her. Oh, creepy. That's pretty nerve wracking. Yeah, that's not good. So Lydia stayed and married George. And the next day, Nellie visited both of them as like a congratulatory. Ugh, this is so gross. And basically like not even an, a nice thing to say. Showed up and went, oh, now that you're married, I should tell you, Lydia, that you're going to die very soon. <gasps> what? Apparently. Shut up. Lydia. She like gave this prophecy of like, just like me, you're going to carry a baby so, full term and both you and the baby will die. What the actual fuck? And then she left. She like never talked to anyone for like 63 days, like over two months. She ghosted her. Literally. She literally ghosted her. Um, oh my God. And this is so fucked up. After those like 60 something days, Nellie came back and the townspeople uh, still wanted to see Nellie. They were like, oh, well now that she's back, we want like our turn at this <sighs> basically okay. attraction. Oh, apparently over a hundred people saw her at different times. Uh -huh. And when they came to visit her, um, 
They're, so they're, the dad, Abner, would take them to the cellar, blow out a candle, and Nellie would knock, and then all of a sudden, like, it seems very routine. It seems very seance There's a scene. panel in the wall. Walk through the panel, yeah. Once we've turned out the lights and, like, you do a signal like a, a signal, knock. right. So uh, apparently this is when she came back and she was super religious. Everything, every response had something to do with God. Um, she would say that she loved Christ. She would sing hymns. Um, she said, I am from above and come on God's message. Um, she apparently was, uh, she started also doing more prophecies and telling like Abner, Lydia's dad went to him and said, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but your dad is in heaven. And Abner was like, no, he's not. And then found out a week ago he had died. Oh no. So she was like correctly <clears throat> prophesizing things. Mm. Um, and Abner, so that freaked Abner out. Uh, apparently on August 13th alone, Nellie got like f almost 50 people to gather, um, because there was this guy in town named James who didn't believe that Nellie was real. And so she like assembled like a 50 person squad to go knock on his door and like, she like prove that she was real. Mm -hmm. Um, so wow. Yeah. There's a lot of drama in this town. She like, she's got a lot, she's building up her own pettiness. Yes. Like she didn't even have that many things to worry about when she was alive. I know she's like create, you're right. She's creating like a afterlife reality show for herself. <laughs> uh, so basically uh, once she appeared at the house, Nellie like from this James guy, she got to his house with the group of 50 people and commanded them to march back to the farmhouse. They were just doing a protest essentially walking to James's house and coming back to her house. Um, so again, like a hundred people marched with her from four different towns to prove that she existed throughout all of the strangeness. Lydia and George did get pregnant. Yeah. Well, and childbirth was very difficult and Lydia nor the baby survived just like, uh, Nellie said what happened. I'm just like, I'm honestly so just the most disturbing part is that there's this child who's like, I don't want to marry this grown man. And then she's pregnant. Like she's forced to marry this man and now she's pregnant. And this then died and then bad. her and her baby were buried next to Nellie. I mean, what is going on? Maybe it's this husband guy. I don't know. I don't trust him for a goddamn second. Um. So also if he's innocent, if I do feel bad, he has two wives and two babies. Maybe all buried he's murdering next to each other. them. I mean, what? I'm just trying to figure Maybe. out here. There's like, no right or wrong answer at this point. Um, I think all, they're all wrong answers because I don't like any of it. <laughs> so George Butler went on to remarry a third time oh, God. to a woman named Mary, and she had four children. Um, and Nellie apparently only appeared one more time uh, to a, a guy named Abraham Cummings. Okay. But Abraham apparently said he was unimpressed with his experience with her. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, no. Honest Abe. And so... <laughs> The reboot just wasn't as good. <laughs> um, so when he returned later, um, Abe, he did have, he was very intrigued and had collected all of these testimonies and then he published them in a collection of letters. So he was like, I wasn't impressed, but here's everyone who was impressed. Man. Um, and in 1806, he was alerted by two men that Nellie had been seen outside of his house. Uh oh. So she was like keeping tabs on him apparently. But, uh, this is what he wrote about the experience. Uh, looking out towards the distance from the house, I saw there as I accidentally looked in the same, or I saw there um, one of the white rocks. This confirmed my opinion of the specter. I paid no more attention to it three months after I accidentally looked in the same direction and the rock was gone. So mm -hmm. like, whatever that doesn't, that does not convince me of anything. Mm -mm. Um, and then apparently he also did see, uh, <laughs> a woman in a dress at one point appear in front of him. Um, he said that he'd heard her voice before. Um, she, he said that he'd gone out to see her one of the times when he caught her, but then she vanished before him still unimpressed apparently. Um, but he published all this in the 1826 pamphlet called immortality proved by testimony of sense. Sure. In yeah, case you wanted to go same. read that classic. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was really it. So people don't know if she was genuinely trying to give George happiness. No. If she was real. She showed up and said, by or, the way, you're going to die. Oops. Or if she you. was a total ruse made up by someone. I think that one. But the last we or heard. Or a demon. Or a demon. Or, but the last time we heard 
of her at all was when Abraham Cummings wrote this like pamphlet of letters and he was like, I saw her a couple times, but she vanished and it wasn't really that special. But we never got answers. So fishy. Maybe if it was a ruse done by Lydia and then she died. True. But also how would she have predicted for herself that she and her baby were going to die before she was even pregnant? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Or maybe maybe she said, wait, no. Maybe it was easy to assume you'd become pregnant if you were going to marry someone and there was no birth control and you're 15. You have no say in the matter, I'm right. sure. Right. I guess she just assumed, like, well, I'll probably be pregnant soon. And maybe people twisted it. Like, no, she totally set, predicted it. It's one of those, like, uh, quote, unsolved mysteries. Because, like, yeah. I have no fucking clue what happened to her. Like, who, somebody's, something's off. I can't tell who's Also, there's lying. never been any other ghost like Nellie where, like, anyone could just go see Nellie at any time, talk to her face-to-face for hours about anything. Yeah, that hasn't been debunked. Or that hasn't been... Like part of some spiritualist it sounded like baloney. parlor tricks when parlor you're like, tricks, you have right. to blow out the candle and then you wait for everyone to be quiet <laughs> and then you knock on the times. door and then she talks to you. And then weirdly, one of the people in the room happens to be gone for some reason and then comes back <laughs> with a wig on. Yeah. And then Harry Price is there. And then Harry Price, he should have been there. I'm mad he wasn't. I'm mad he wasn't too because he would have fixed that. Really? He flies to the mongoose, but he doesn't fly to the lady <laughs> in the dress in the field? This one at, at least had some like quote evidence to it she's so. pushing wagons around so anyway i think since people saw her in town and stuff that it was like somebody from out of town that had a very distinct look or something and people were like no that's i don't anyway, know i don't know but i'm sorry that was so long but that's the story the unfinished story of nelly butler wow okay well i mean i'm just gonna jump right into mine because mine is also long um and it's uh it's a lot it's it's kind of like hopefully when- it's not as dramatic i feel bad that half my story was me trying to continually remind people how everyone was related to each other. No, that's literally what most... my story is. And Oh, great. My, Two family trees you get to learn today. My fear was that this would be too convoluted. Like, Oh, great. Well, I've clearly given you like yes. something to compete the with. The second you said that the first time I went, well, thank God it's not just me because... I hope is... no one started today with a headache and thought, wow, the new episode of And That's Why We Drink is really going to solve all my if problems. If you thought that we would get rid of your headache, you have another <laughs> thing. You uh, clearly, clearly don't understand here. this show. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Okay, so this is the story of the Ketty Cabin murders. Great. Ketty Cabin? Yeah. Anybody? Sounds precious. Anybody? No, not me. Um, Okay, so this uh, takes place in Ketty, California, which is in Northern California. Um, So in 1980, Sue Sharp... Uh, who's a 36 year old. So remember these names because there's just a lot of people. Look, we just had to go through like a round of Degrassi with my, with my yeah, story. This so is we're like Degrassi plus all their, um, let me get my shoes family. off. Let me get a little comfy. Oh boy. Okay. Okay. No fish flops today. huh? No fish flops. No, no, no. This was a serious day. Thank God. Okay. So Sue Sharp, she's a 36 year old mother of five living in Connecticut and she is stuck in an abusive marriage. She has five kids with her husband. The kids are Johnny, Sheila, so, okay, sorry, Johnny's 15, Sheila's 14, Tina, who's 12, Rick is 10, and Greg is 5. So, basically, uh, she has two daughters and three sons, five kids. All 10 years apart. All, like, 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 within within 10 10 years. years. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, With all 10 years apart. All 10 years apart. She's had one every decade. (laughs) Um, So, she's in this marriage. It's unhealthy, unhappy. Um, So, in 1980, she... uh, takes her five kids and leaves her husband. She's in Connecticut. She travels all the way to Ketty, California, which is uh, her brother lives in nearby Quincy, which is um, in Northern California. It's a, so Ketty is a small town. Um, it's has this population of less than a hundred people. It's Ooh. Yeah, very small, quaint cabin. Ugh. Listen, under other circumstances, under this other, would be my new favorite under town. Extremely other circumstances. I love, I love a quaint nature have cozy town. Have you not heard town. of this story? No, none of those hundred people have talked to me before. No, really. Okay, so anyway, so she picks Caddy, California, because her husband, or her sorry, her brother lives nearby in Quincy, and it's a very small town, sense of community, less than hundred people, yada yada. Um, she wants to start fresh. So she moves her five kids, they move in and basically they immediately fit in. Like they're making friends. The kids have friends. They play in all the different cabins. It's working out well. It's working out well. And they live in cabin 28. Ooh. Cabin 28. So uh, this is in Plumas County, California, if anyone has any grasp on where that is. Uh, Me. Me neither. So at the center of Ketty was Ketty Resort. And it's these 33 rustic cabins that could be rented out long term. So like long term rentals. 
Um, and it was about $170 a month. So she and the five kids rented cabin 28. So they tended to keep to themselves. Um, but the kids went to local school and had friends in the basically in the forest, like it's in the woods and there's all these cabins. So they would run to each other's houses and play. Um, so here we go. Around 7 a.m. on the morning of Sunday, April 12th, 1981, 14-year-old Sheila Sharp, so she's the oldest daughter, right. was at a sleepover at her friend's cabin across the road, the Seabolt family. Okay. Meanwhile, 15-year-old John, and he has a friend named Dana, um, okay. who's another boy. He's 17 years old. And the two of them hitchhiked to Quincy for a party and returned that night. So okay. Sheila, the oldest daughter, is at her friend's house. And, and Johnny's gone. Johnny and Dana are at a party, and then they hitchhike home. Uh, to the party and then home that night. Gotcha. So Sheila, the next morning, uh, finishes her sleepover, walks home, opens the door, and is met with a horrific sight. Uh, the cabin is full of bodies tied together, covered <gasps> in blood. She sees a hammer and a bent knife, <gasps> and she just fucking runs. Good. Yeah. Good girl. And she's like, I don't know if anyone's there. I, she's like, I, I don't want to know. She said she didn't even know, like, register who was there or who yeah, was dead, how could she you? just fucking bolted. So she runs back to her friend, the Seabolt's house, her friend's house. She says, I remember dropping my stuff, running back next door, screaming. So the Seabolt's call the police and send their older son, Jamie, to the cabin to take oh, a no. look. <laughs> They're like not even sure if this killer. Like even the parents themselves are like, eh, our oldest can go yeah, check you it go out. You go check. Yeah. <laughs> and like we're busy calling the sheriff. You go check. Yeah. It's like they don't even know if there's a murderer in, in the, the house. closet. Yeah. Like, yeah. So they send the oldest um, to check it out. And he goes over there, Jamie. And uh, he kind of creeps around quietly to get a look at what's going on. And he sees a back window. And he glances in the back window. And he notices that the younger boys are in their bedroom. They're in their beds fast asleep. And they're alive. Oh, shit. Yeah. Okay, well, that's kind of good. Yeah. So 10-year-old Rick and 5-year-old Greg. And then they had a friend over named Justin who's 12. They were all still alive. And they were <sighs> sleeping. Oh my God, can you imagine if you were Justin's parents? You're like, you're never going to sleep ever again. Well, Justin's parents come into this whole story. Oh, no. But <laughs> but yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Because you're like, yeah, my, go to your friend's house for the night. And then it's like, well, this is what happened. That terrifies me I about my breakfast. own kids going to sleep over. Seriously. I'm like, oh, my gosh, please, please don't let there be a mass murder happen. Yeah, I'm going to be that there. parent who's like, I'm going to do a quick background check real quick um, oh my gosh. on everybody. Um, okay, so... Da, da, da. the kids are alive so jamie and sheila sheila's the sister open the window and help out the kids so they don't have to see what happened in the front of the house they help kind of pull them out of the window sure pretty soon the sheriff arrives and sue sharp's brother don so sue's the mom so her brother don who lives in quincy comes as well so the sheriff and don arrive and don has to identify the bodies yikes so According to Sheila, it took uncle, her Uncle Don a couple times to determine that it was definitely the bodies of 15-year-old Johnny, his friend Dana, who had been together at that party, yeah. who's age 17, and his sister, the kid's mother, Sue, who had been murdered. So the three of them are the victims. Sue was found nude from the waist down but so, showed no signs of sexual assault. Okay. Sheila's brother uh, and his friend Dana were found bound with electrical cord and wire gagged and had been brutally tortured for a long period of time oh fuck so in the room so in the room it's covered in blood f literally floor walls and ceiling covered in blood um the investigation team finds a bent steak knife a bloody butcher knife and a claw hammer and um because of the marks of the blood police believe the victims had been moved and rearranged after they were murdered so they had been like put Ugh. together and tied up um they noted the room hadn't been ransacked. Nothing had been stolen, so it seemed like a personal It was just crime. an attack. Right, rather than a burglary. So, again, this is, like, a tiny-ass town. There are fewer than 100 people in this town, and, like, this lady and her five kids show up, and within a year, there's just, like, a brutal right. multiple murder um, in one of the cabins of, like, kids, too. So right. it's just, like, obviously rocks this town. Um, after a few hours to kind of allow the survivors to, like, readjust um, – Justin, who's the friend that came for the sleepover. So Justin, his name is Justin Smart. And not to be confused with Sharp, which is the family. Uh -huh. So that's why it gets a little confusing. Two adjectives. Yeah. Um, yes. Two good adjectives. Yeah. Yeah. So Justin is taken for an interview by Sheriff Thomas um, inside his patrol car. 
In the interview, Justin remembers continuously saying to Sheriff Thomas, where's Tina? Tina's missing. Oh, no. I totally forgot for the other kids. So did everybody else. Okay. <laughs> so apparently the sheriff did not acknowledge him on this statement. Great. Um, Tina Sharp was Sue's 12-year-old daughter, right. and she had been at the Seabolts watching movies with Sheila the night before and was go- wanted to stay over, but Sheila and her friend told her, it's just going to be a sleepover for the older girls, so you have to leave and go home. Hmm. So you know how kids are. Like, yeah. no, you can't hang out with us, like yeah. the younger sibling. So Tina wanted to hang out with her older sister, and her older sister made her go home. And then Ooh, and her older then- sister walked home, saw this, and now her sister's missing. Right. So um, she had head, headed back to the cabin around 9.30 p.m. because her older sister was like, you can't play with us. Right. So it took Justin's mom, Marilyn Smart, to interrupt Sheriff Thomas to say, will you be quiet for a moment and listen to what this boy is telling you? He's telling you that Tina is missing for them Thank to God, finally yeah. be like, Wake oh, up. shit. Yeah. So basically, so far, there are three murders, Sue Sharp, the mother, John Sharp, the son, and Dana Wingate, who's the friend of the son. Right. Then there's one child missing, the daughter, Tina Sharp. And the three boys who survived are Rick and Greg, the sons, and, and Justin. Justin. Right. Their friend and neighbor. And um, so now with the knowledge of, that Tina is missing also, the FBI are called to the scene. But now it's been several hours. They've lost, like, hours of time because nobody jumped on this fact that Tina was right. missing. Um, so the police collected evidence throughout the house, anything that might have a connection to the homicides, including the hammer, knife, um, the steak knife, the hammer, I said that, the hammer, the knife, and the bent steak knife, um, which they deduced had been bent in the torture. Yeah, I, I, that was assumed in my mind. It really, really, really doesn't yeah. feel good. Um, and they noted that the only thing missing from the house was a shoebox that Tina had been using for a school project. Okay. Strange. Um, so according to one of my fave websites, all that's interesting, the cabin's telephone had been left off the hook and all of the lights had been shut off and the drapes had all been closed. Hmm. The home didn't show any signs of forced entry, but detectives did recover an unidentified fingerprint from a handrail on the back stairs, but this was pre-DNA testing. So even though they could check fingerprints, they couldn't check DNA in the blood. Um, there were panels taken off the walls because they had blood on them. Um, And then a former FBI agent named Larry Ott recalled that, quote, the most strange thing for him was that the walls had knife marks in them, like someone had been throwing a knife trying to stick it in the wall. Just all very gruesome, just horrible. So they went through all of Sue's exes because, you know, they look into the husband first. So Jim was the guy she had just left in Connecticut who had apparently also allegedly sexually abused Sheila and Tina, his daughters. Oh, fuck. So, But he was on the other side of the country, still in Connecticut. Like, there was no way he could have been involved. So uh, they had him off the hook for now, and they're focusing on Tina because they're like, well, most importantly, we need to get her back. So they narrowed in on one of her teachers, a guy named Joel Lipsy, mm. who apparently had a fixation on her. <gasps> yeah. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh, he had a picture of her on his desk and at his house that he just like, kept. And like nobody fucking did anything. They were like, oh, he's just kind of creepy. It's like this is how okay. these things happen. Okay. So people around town said he was obsessed with her, but he had an alibi. Um but fun fact, he quickly left town and was later arrested in his new town uh, for molesting a young girl. So, wow, shocker. Okay. Uh, so now they're thinking maybe Tina wasn't the target, even though she's missing. Um, Sheila herself even said she thinks her mom was the intended target. And maybe the kids were just in the way and had witnessed something. And so they were murdered. Right. Um, so a neighbor had reported they had heard a muffled scream around 1.30 a.m. But went back to sleep because they weren't sure where it was coming from. And then, like, one thing you wonder is if the neighbor heard the scream, why are the three boys asleep and didn't hear anything? And not one of them woke up. So it's just a little strange to me. Huh. You know what I mean? I hadn't even, that hadn't even processed. You know there was screaming. Yeah. Which is awful, but. Yeah. And, like, they were being, the knives were being thrown into the wall. Bodies are being dragged around. Like, you'd think one of the three would have heard something. So then my theory, did the kids leave at all? The kids were definitely there the whole time? They got home that night. Um, and nothing was amiss when they got home. So it happened after they got home and they weren't drugged to fall asleep or anything. And, oh, and the one, the two kids were five and 10. So they were like home the whole, oh, sorry. No, the ones who were miss who had been gone came home 
and right. were then murdered. Right. Right. The the youngest ones, five, ten, and twelve, were all asleep the whole time. Yeah, that's weird. Right? I thought so. So now they're focusing on the kids who were alive. Um, so Justin Smart, the friend. Yes. Maybe the killer like gagged them first or like threatened them and said, like, you don't want to wake up your kids because then I'll do something to them. <gasps> Good point. So like to they're save like, we know them, there's kids in the other room to, to mm. save them, made them stay quiet while they were getting tortured. It's a very which good... I find impossible. I, yeah, that's a very good point. I don't know. I mean, I'm trying no, to think like a, cure, like a killer. It's true. My only thought then would be like, what about like the bent knives like being thrown? In the I wall feel like if you're torturing people to a point where the knives are bending, yeah. like there's no keeping quiet even if you want to. Yeah, you'd think. I don't know. Anyway, but yeah, that's a good point. Like maybe they threaten them into silence. That's true. Um, so now they're talking to the kids and Justin, the friend who stayed over says he has something he thinks could help. Let's hear it. Justin says he keeps having dreams that mirror the attack. Okay. Uh, So now the sheriff's department decides they're going to learn how to do hypnosis. (laughs) Fuck off. So they go to two different training sessions to learn how to do hypnosis. Couldn't they just bring in a hypnosis? (laughs) Nope. Uh, nope, I guess not. A hypnotist? Wow, I'm so stupid. Okay. Well, yeah. But so maybe you need a course. Maybe. <laughs> and how to say any. the word. <laughs> um, okay, so they do hip- hypnosis with Justin, and this is a month after the murder, which, by the way, like, they should have fucking really interviewed him. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Earlier, but. <laughs> yeah. According to Sheriff Thomas, quote, under hypnosis, he didn't actually say that he had saw anything, but described watching the love boat and then in detail talked about a fight and talked about Sue. And at the end, Sue was thrown overboard. Okay. So this makes me wonder if he's like projecting, if he had seen something or heard something and he's, this memory is playing out as like projected onto like a TV show like that putting he loved. It, like framing it in a way that his own brain can yes, process. As like a child. Right. That's what I was thinking, especially when he says he keeps having dreams and needs to tell somebody about it. Yeah. Also, Justin was able to indicate body placements, which were very close to being correct, if not fully correct, and descriptions of the attacks, including a yellow blanket that was covering Sue's chest. And remember, he had been pulled out of the window, so he didn't, right. like, see, presumably hadn't seen anything. Um, so he Unless knew, maybe he, like, saw it, saw it and then, night. like, it was so traumatic, he was like, I, I need to go to sleep. Right, like, <laughs> I'm like, just gonna, this is not real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, he, basically, he knew about this yellow blanket, which... Just like, how would you know that? And how would you know where the bodies were placed? This is sometimes how nosy neighbors are important. Yes, true. <laughs> Maybe we should send our kids to sleepovers in case they need to wit- be witness Maybe. to a murder, you know? Yeah, you yeah. never know. Um, so according to Crime and Investigation, quote, under hypnosis, Justin recalled his dream. He described two men in the home. One had a mustache and long hair, while the other had shorter hair and was clean shaven. Justin recalled that one of the men had a pocket knife in his right hand, which he used to cut Sue in the chest. In his dream, the same man had a hammer in the other hand. In another hypnosis session, Justin described Tina waking up and walking into the living room to see what was going on. Oh, no. According to Justin, a man then snatched Tina up in his arms and carried her through the kitchen and out to the back steps. Moments later, the man then returned on his own. So now either the thoughts are he did observe this and had as a defense mechanism, his brain had like repressed the memory or shut it out completely. Or told him like, you're dreaming, go back to sleep. Yes, exactly. And like turned it into like not reality. Or was he just hearing what everyone was saying about the case and had created kind of like a narrative? Right. Because he knew Tina was missing. He knew that this was probably two men or multiple people. I'm going to go with the first one. The first, the repressed memory. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense with the blanket and everything. And again, but it was also a month later. So it's like, I'm sure he's heard a lot of right. rumors. I'm sure he has had to be grappling with this the whole time. So who knows how much of it is like real or how much right. of it is in his head. Um, so in any case, under hypnosis, he had described the men he had seen as wearing jeans and denim jackets and gold framed sunglasses. So then they created these sketches that police released for identification. I'm going to show you the sketches, actually. Here you go. I have them here. I mean, it's like old-timey from the 80s. Oh, okay. So if, if this wasn't like a really serious crime report, they look like cartoons. They do look like cartoons. They look like outlines of The Simpsons. Yes, they do. They look like cartoon characters. So um, interestingly, Justin's mother saw these and goes, 
I know who those people are. Oh, fuck off. It's That's the amazing. Simpsons character. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's Ned Flanders. It's Love Boat characters. He's really there. <laughs> um, no, she said she knows who it is. It's her husband, oh. Martin Smart, who's a Vietnam vet and Justin's stepfather. And the other guy is John Bo Bubade. So his name is Bo. So Martin and Bo. And Bo's a family friend who was living with them at the time. And they had met at the VA hospital in Reno. Also, shout out to her for like, uh, like ratting out her husband. Being like, hey, I know these <laughs> I people. Know these They're in my living people. room right now. Yeah. Right. So, but then part of the question then becomes, well, wouldn't Justin have been like, it was my dad and Friend. Maybe it was too hard for him to process. Yeah, that's the other thing, too. We've heard, I feel like I, that's happened with kids where they're like, no, it wasn't. Like, you know, your brain yeah. is very but powerful. But again, if he's explaining it away as a dream in my head, I would be like, oh, and I know it was a dream because, like, I watched my own dad do it. And, like, I know that's not true. Yeah, true. You know, you'd think that would play a part, like, if you saw your stepdad. Maybe also, maybe he didn't pay attention to who the people actually were because mm-hmm. he was paying attention to the bloody okay, that true. tortured people. And if you, right, you're not like assuming your dad would be in the, or your stepdad is, your, your brain probably wouldn't even go there. You'd be like, there were these two men. Yeah. Your brain wouldn't be like, I wonder if I know them. Like, yeah. I don't know. And, and also if they were wearing thought, sunglasses at night and like disguises. Oh, right. Yeah. They could have done like the, 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 to, the stockings on the face thing or something. Well, he said he, cause he drew oh, their he faces. Saw them. Yeah. Huh. It's kind of weird. Also, I wonder, like, so does that mean maybe he didn't get a good look of at them? Because if he had, then wouldn't his own stepfather, if it were him, go to him later and be like, you can't tell anyone what you saw. Like, neither, right. maybe they didn't see each other. Well. Okay. You'll see. Going. You'll see more. Sorry. No, no. That's, like, remember that. Okay. okay. So uh, Martin and Bo had met while they were in the psych unit at the VA hospital in Reno. Um, so... Marilyn, Justin's mom, is like, that's my husband and his friend. Other locals also saw the sketches and went, ah, uh, that looks a lot like Martin and Bo. Um, and apparently, if you put the top half of one face with the bottom half of the other face, they were, like, really spot on. Really? So part of me thinks maybe he just kind of disassociated with what he had seen and, like, uh-huh. didn't his brain didn't want to connect it. Right. But here's a picture. I'm pretty sure I have a picture here. Um, so this is when the, the faces are, like, combined Ooh. and then here's a picture of martin which again like it's hard to see but he does kind of have that like yeah. skinny face also yeah in a town of literally less than 100 people right. like you better expect everyone knows who everyone is wow so anyway uh so a lot of people were like yeah that looks exactly like them as uh, as mentioned earlier, Martin and the Smart family lived nearby. They were the neighbors of Cabin 28. And on the night of the homicides, Marilyn, the wife, who was like, that's my husband, uh, recalled Martin and Bo had gone to a hotel bar wearing, according to the Plumas News, three-piece suits and sunglasses. Now, the description that Justin Gabe was that they were in jeans and t-shirts, but again, they could have changed, but they right. were wearing sunglasses in his description at night. Again. Uh. So that's still weird. They were wearing sunglasses. And then you wonder why on earth are we, are they wearing a three piece suit to the local bar? Right. And people have theorized like maybe an alibi, mm-hmm. like, Oh, we wouldn't, they wear wanted jeans. to be seen or that yeah. they wanted to be remembered that people were like, yeah, we saw them. They were being real weird in their suits or like, we we remember them not wearing jeans. Or, yeah, we remember them wearing something <laughs> so different from denim yeah. that, like, you would never believe it. Yeah, that's a good point. It also would make sense if, like, that's why maybe there wasn't, like, a, uh, I forget what the, the phrase is, but, like, there wasn't, like, a, a broken entry or anything in the house. Oh, right. Like, if you just saw, like, oh, my next-door neighbor. He knows them. Right. The, the guy who has. Whose, whose kid is here. Whose kid I'm watching. Totally. Maybe he wants to come in and talk to his kid. Totally. It's, like, that would make sense why there was an. Yes, why well, they didn't have yeah. to break in. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's a good point. Um, so before going out, apparently, Martin wanted his wife Marilyn to go to Cabin 28 to see if Sue would go to the bar with them because Martin's friend Bo kind of had a crush on her and was like, I want her to join us. Ah. Marilyn was like, Sue's not going to come. She doesn't drink. She's not going to want to go. But her husband, Martin, insisted that Bo wants her to go. So Marilyn went down to ask Sue, and apparently Sue refused. And apparently Martin, and especially Bo, got very upset by this rejection. And um, apparently 
uh, she had, there was allegedly she had said also um, that she was not interested in him. Like she was kind of right. like grossed out or like, not, no. Wasn't the vibe. Wasn't it. Wasn't yeah. happening for they her. Weren't, they weren't vibing. They weren't vibing, according to her. So apparently this pissed Bo off and uh, Martin. And so they went to drink. So apparently um, the co-owner of the bar said they left after a few hours when the music changed from country to rock and they were very disappointed. Okay. So, that's what people remember from that night. Allegedly that night, Marilyn went to bed early while Bo and Martin were still at the bar. She does remember waking up around 2 a.m. after hearing noises from another room in the house and saw a glimpse of them burning something in the stove, although Martin told her it was just a log. Okay. The day after the homicide, Martin spontaneously drove to Reno um, around 5 or 6 p.m., allegedly, quote, high on something, according to his friend Glenna Meeks. And he kept saying, I got to go to Ketty. I got to go to Ketty. To which Glenna responded, Marty, you don't need to go to Ketty. Someone is out there killing people. <laughs> By this point, Martin was walking up and down the room saying, but I need to go. There's something I started that has to be finished. Ugh. Yeah. So at around 9 p.m., Glenna finally persuaded him, like, you're not driving back there. Sleep here. And he stayed there until 4 a.m. and went back home. So he mm. basically left town, had like a meltdown, and then drove back the next morning. Strange. So the police conducted a thorough search of the smart residence. They found um, plenty of knives, but Marty was a chef, so it wasn't, like, weird that he would own a steak knife. Right. Um, apparently one of the knives was missing, but, again, that doesn't prove anything, but it's right. still a sign. They also found duct tape, a hangman's noose, and Hustler magazine, which, again, doesn't really prove anything, but interesting. Uh, they then searched a shack nearby where the kids sometimes played. Like an abandoned shack. Um, okay. Fun. Uh, Marilyn joined the search and noticed some floorboards had been torn up that weren't torn up before. Oh. And she asked the kids if they had done it, and they said they didn't do it. So somebody had torn up these floorboards, and it wasn't the kids. Uh, the police then interviewed both Marty and Bo in great detail, the sheriff claims, but he interviewed them at the same time. Okay. Like you don't do that because you keep everyone separate. Yes, because then they can fucking like play off each other right. and create their own story. You need to separate people who are suspects right, right. to make sure they, you mm. know. Okay. So anyway, the sheriff is like, oh no, we interviewed them in great detail. He was convinced they weren't involved. Is sure. what the sheriff says. Uh huh. The guy who also wasn't listening to the child saying mm -hmm. there's a missing kid. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And okay. who interviewed him in his patrol car. The guy who also tried to become a hypnotist. Yeah. <laughs> Not tried to become. He did. He become. did. You he know what? Love boat. I'll give him that. A new script out of that. He got a love boat screenplay <laughs> out of that. He got a spec real good. A spec script out of that hypnosis session. Um. So around two days after the homicides, Justin, the the friend, and his brother were playing on the floor, and Marilyn overheard Justin saying. No, Casey, you have to do it this way. She uh -oh. glanced in and saw that Justin was instructing Casey on how to fake stab him with Justin then defending himself from the stabbing action. Justin went on to say, I have to protect Sue. I have to protect Sue. Oh, no. Yeah. And he's 12. <sighs> and so at this point, Martin, his stepdad, saw what was going on, grabbed Justin, and yelled, you will never talk about this again, ever. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so guilty. So back to the stepdad guilty. <laughs> knowing that the kid knows something. Yeah. And interesting that the kid wasn't touched. Uh-huh. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's a reason they left the kids be in the other room. Right. So Martin then uh, took Justin outside, but Marilyn doesn't know what he said or what was done. But um, before this incident, Justin was able to describe the crime scene so clearly as if he had walked in there after the fact or as if, quote, he could have been standing in the hall next to the doorway and seen it all. Uh -huh. So there was a spot, too, where he could have been standing and, like, they wouldn't have necessarily noticed right. he was there. Um, so after Martin had threatened Justin, he seemed to have forgotten everything, never brought it up again. So this is just bad sign, bad news bears. Um, and this was despite the fact that the police had taken Justin's tennis shoes and reported there was evidence that he had walked through the crime scene in those shoes. Really? Yeah. And he just was like suddenly forgot everything. Weird. Yeah. Um, police nowadays say they have no clue what happened to those tennis shoes. And Sheriff Thomas, quote, did not recall anything about Justin's shoes. Okay, so this guy's also getting paid off, right? Something's up with this guy. Like he's yeah. sketch. He 
apparently retired shortly after the murders. Oh, did he? Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, did he? I bet oh, that was a he? fun retirement party. Kel surprise. Kel surprise. Um, so no shock here. The case went unsolved. So the Plumas County Sheriff's Office did not investigate the full potential, obviously. Um, either Sheriff Thomas uh, didn't want to, had something to hide perhaps, or was getting paid off or was involved. Like, we don't know, but something fishy happened. Uh, years later, the sheriff's office admitted that some of the DNA evidence was never analyzed. Uh, Justin believes he saw something on the night of the homicide or something of the aftermath, but can't remember it. Um, then, this is worth Remember Tina? Who could forget? Oh, wait, the cop. Oh, wait, <laughs> the literal sheriff of the town. <laughs> Good point. Three years to the day of the homicide, police got an anonymous tip from a caller saying they knew where Tina was. Oh, God. They followed this tip and they did find Tina's remains. They found a skull. <sighs> yeah. In a remote Ooh. location known as Feather Falls, approximately 50 miles from the Ketty Resort um, in a Boy Scouts camp. The call was not investigated, was not documented properly, um, but it directly led them to her remains. Um, Unfortunately, there was too little of her body left for investigators to determine what happened to her. Excuse me. But according to all that's interesting, uh, near the remains, detectives found a child's blanket, a blue nylon jacket, a pair of jeans with a missing back pocket, and an empty surgical tape dispenser. Oh. (sighs) So creepy. Uh, So they used dental records. It was identified as Tina. Wow. Um, According to the medical examiner, Tina had died sometime after November 1st, 1981, which was six months after the Ketty murders. Oh. Yeah. So either she was being held. Yeah. Or who knows what. Um, When Sheila, that was really sad too. She was interviewed in like this People People Magazine documentary I watched. And she was like, they told me they found Tina. And I was like, oh, when can I see her? And they were (sighs) like, and I'm like, you have to find a better way to phrase that. Sorry. Like, oh, we found. So Yikes. she was like so excited and her yeah. little sister was found and then like, yeah. So apparently Sheila went to go visit her family's graves in the late eighties and saw that Tina only had a little tin plaque. So in 2002, she was able to afford a headstone for Tina and gave her like a full memorial service and everything. Wow. Um, in 2004, the Plumas County Sheriff's Office agreed to show Sheila a timeline of her family's murders, but refused to answer any questions about Martin Smart. But here's what we do know. So we found out later that Marilyn's daughter, Lori, who was living with her for a while, who's uh, Martin's her stepdad as well. So I guess Justin's sister, Lori, um, confessed that after the events, she was terrified of her stepdad, Martin, and went back to Oregon to live with her stepmother. Mm. A week after Lori leaving, Martin called the cops and said that Lori had run away. But then he later confessed that he had put Lori on the bus and sent her away. What? I don't know. Apparently he wanted her out of there. So who knows what she knew or whatever. Um, According to Marilyn, the night after the murders, Lori also received a call from an unknown number telling her she could be next if she didn't keep her mouth shut. Yeah. So she didn't even know about the homicides yet at that point when she got this call. And she's like, what? Um, So she was terrified. She didn't know who it was. You'd think if it were her stepdad, she would have recognized the voice. But maybe it was a friend who had like covered up his voice a little bit. I'm not sure. Um, Then, according to Lori, on the Monday after the homicides, she was called to the principal's office where they said there was a family emergency. And on the phone, her stepdad, Martin, said Justin, her brother, had witnessed the murder of five people, which is odd because there was a murder of three Three people people. and one was missing. So it was just like. So maybe he witnessed Tina or maybe the plan or something was. Uh, Yeah, maybe Tina. I mean, he witnessed clearly, according to her being taken. He saw her being taken out. It's true. I don't know who the fifth person yeah, would be. Yeah, I don't either. Oh, God. So that was just odd, too, because, like, it's just a very specific number. Um, months later, Martin went to jail for a different crime, and Marilyn literally never saw him again. Um, while Does in- Marilyn say that it's probably him? Yes. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. While incarcerated, Martin reportedly got into an... It sounds like everyone was scared of him, too, yeah. you know? While incarcerated, Martin reportedly got into an argument with another inmate named Meeks and yelled, you know I got her, Meeks, and I'm going to get you in the same way. So not a good sign. In 97, the Plumas County Sheriff's Office told Sheila that Martin Smart was dead, although he wouldn't die for three more years. What? So like What's going on with this police department? This sheriff department is effed up. I don't know what is going (laughs) on, but apparently he was literally remarried and living in Portland, Oregon, and they called her and told her he was dead. What it's just fuck? really strange. Okay. Um, 
the only thing she ever heard from Martin again was a postcard she received saying, Bo is dead, Marty. But Bo literally was still alive and ha- didn't, right. wouldn't die for seven more years either. And he lived in Holiday, Florida. So, like, they both went to, like, opposite side of the country and then tried to tell Marilyn that the other one was dead. That's Sounds so like. weird. So that maybe she would drop it? I don't know. Weird. Um, So in 2013, the case was reopened by the current sheriff, whose name is Greg Hagwood, and an investigator named Mike Gamberg, who both knew uh, John and Dana, the kids, Uh because they were the same age when they were murdered. Right. Um, Which also goes to show, like, how long this has taken that, like, now they're sheriff in the town and, like, they're close for, or their friend or acquaintances, they finally want to solve this murder. Um, he said the case continued to haunt him because he was now in charge of the evidence that had been left ignored or deliberately buried by law enforcement for three decades. Um, Sheila says for what it's worth, she's relieved. Finally, somebody cares and has taken over the case. Um, Gamberg has re-interviewed it. Excuse me. Jeez. Re-interviewed anyone still related, related to the case. Um, although Martin and Bo by now are dead, but like they can still be charged posthumously or like at least you know, solved. Um, cabin 28 was demolished in 2004 and actually in the Buzzfeed unsolved, um, they did an episode on this and they went to the site in the woods. Oh wow. And it was so creepy. They were like walking through the rub, like the rubble of it. It's really creepy. Um, so Gamberg organized boxes from the case reports and noticed that like certain evidence had been put to the side, including one, a letter from Martin to his wife, Marilyn, sent shortly after the murders. And it, this is literally what his fucking letter from Martin to Marilyn says. I've paid the price for your love, and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you <gasps> tell me we are through. Great. What else do you want? Oh, my God. Okay. Well, there you go. Which begs the question, was Marilyn also involved? And she didn't... She didn't partake at the end? Or yeah, didn't she didn't want to, like... Didn't deliver, didn't want to implicate her <sighs> husband, or I don't know. She claims she doesn't remember the letter, but she does recognize that it's Martin's handwriting. So it is confirmed to be a letter from him to her. Wow. Even though she doesn't remember it, which is like, that seems like something you'd remember. But Gamberg also found the anonymous phone call, um, and they had never been analyzed, that told them where Tina was. And um, Greg Hagwood commented, why that sat in a sealed evidence envelope never opened, I don't have the answer to that, but we have it now. Uh, Years after the homicide, Marilyn came forward with a jacket she had found in their basement that had blood on it, um, thinking maybe it belonged to Tina. Uh, But Sheriff Thomas dismissed it, and it vanished, and he claimed he never remembered getting it. Uh Uh-huh. So, okay, shady. Uh, Gamberg spoke to – so Martin, the V – you know, he was part of the VA hospital in Reno – He had a counselor there, and Martin's counselor said in his seventh appointment just weeks after the Ketty murders, he confessed to the murder. But, like, don't you have to tell if someone confesses they murdered someone? (laughs) Like, isn't that I'm pretty sure. Like, isn't that, like, this is no longer patient confidentiality here? Like, Uh you murdered somebody? Um, So, according to the counselor, in May of 1981, Martin said, quote, I killed the woman and her daughter, but I didn't have anything to do with the boys. The counselor passed. The, oh, okay, sorry. The counselor passed this information onto the police at the time and was surprised investigators hadn't used this confession against Martin. I'm somehow not surprised. Yeah, so I forgot that piece was even there. Um, the uh, oh, that's right. The agents the counselor had met with dismissed the confession as quote hearsay. What? That's not how this works. That's not how it works. Someone had found a claw hammer using a metal detector also near a pond um, near the cabin, which matched the description. But when he found it, uh, he didn't know what it was. So he just threw it into the lake. (laughs) Oh, my God. So he was watching. He was on a website later and like was reading about the case and was like, oh, shit, I found that hammer and called police. Fuck. And they went and got it out of the lake um, and they tested it uh, for blood as an additional murder weapon. But still to this day, nobody's been charged. The case still remains cold, but there are six people of interest still alive, which just means they might know something. Um, So according to Sheriff Hagwood, quote, there are people locally who know more than they've said, and I believe we've identified some of them, and we know who they are, and we know where they are. And I have every confidence that they either participated after the fact or they have firsthand information. It's a theory we are working that Martin and Bo are involved to the degree possible to conclude or dismiss. There's a disproportionate amount of evidence and information that points in their direction. Right. So, yeah. To say, like, oh, we have a hunch. Like, whatever. Like, they did it. They literally. They did it. They did it. I mean, he wrote in a letter, I killed four people. What more do you want from me? No, no, no. That's your say. Right. That's right. 
We all forgot about that letter. <laughs> right. That love letter. Also, a lot of evidence just vanished after the sheriff already saw that it. That bloody jacket, just nobody remembers it. Oh, my gosh. In 1987, Sheriff Doug Thomas, fucking, you know, Sheriff Thomas, his uh, uh, his deputy, Lieutenant Don Stoy, recalled to the Sacramento, Sacramento Bee, the strangest thing is that there is no apparent motive. Any case without an apparent motive is the toughest to solve. So they really just acted like they had no fucking clue what was going on. But, like... Yeah, okay. Yes, that's what I was going to say. Sorry. So, but they're like, okay, well, what? So now we're thinking, well, what is the motive? Because if they did it, but like, why? I don't think you need one at this point. You don't like, need one. Like, clearly it's going to take another 30 years for you to find the motive. <laughs> just, you just, well, admit I have that some, they did it. I have some theories and I'm going to see what you think. So, okay. many believe that obviously Martin and Bo were guilty, including Marilyn, who says, um, Bo once said to her, it would not have bothered him to kill a child or abroad. Okay, well, that's a red flag. Yeah. This theory would also explain why the three boys, which included Justin, were spared. Uh-huh. Even though there was blood found on the doorknob. So somebody either opened the door and looked in to see them. Someone knew they were there and didn't kill them, which right. leads people to believe it was them. Um, some people think they were part of, quote, a big dope deal and someone was at the wrong place. Um, apparently, Keddy had, like, kind of a wreck reputation connected to the Chicago crime syndicate. Um, and some believe Bo was actually involved with the federal government as a police informant and the department of justice covered up the crime to protect their asset. And reportedly uh, department of justice, special agents flew over in a helicopter right after the murder. And they were like, and the FBI got involved as we know. So some people think there's a conspiracy here that like the government covered it up because Bo was, involved with them on some okay. sort of like sting operation or That's, i think a stretch it's a stretch <laughs> it's fully okay. a stretch um because also like why is he murdering people that's like that's like a like a oh big stretch yeah it's not like, like the department <laughs> just like shit he killed a kid let's just yeah not tell anybody yeah it's just weird um in another train of thought according to martin's counselor marilyn smart said she had wanted a divorce the day of the murder okay um and marilyn had apparently sought advice from sue weeks before because Martin uh -huh. was abusive and cheating on her, and uh, Sue had said, you need to leave him. Right, so, she, so it, it was her fault. It That's was her fault. Yeah. So when Martin discovered Marilyn had gone to Sue, Sue became, quote, responsible for Marilyn wanting a divorce, and um, especially if they were drinking and who knows what. And some people believe Martin was having an affair with Sue, and Sue was counseling Marilyn to leave Martin, and so Martin took her out of the picture. Um, but... There's also a theory that Tina was the target, like with that creepy teacher, maybe something oh, right. was involved with the creepy Who could forget? Who could forget? Everyone. The sheriff. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> but more than likely, it was part of a, a cover-up with Keddy. According to Martin Smart's counselor, Martin told him he and Sheriff Thomas were good friends. Mm. Um, it's even been suggested they may have been involved in nefarious activities together. Um, Sheriff Thomas used to live in cabin 28 and even let Martin live with him for a while when he and Marilyn, so maybe he had a key. Who knows? Oh. Um, that just occurred to me, but perhaps, um, when he and Marilyn were having marital problems, apparently he doesn't only do hypnosis. He also gave them marriage counseling, the sheriff, uh, at one point. So okay. anyway, end of story, the, uh, Ketty murders still remain unsolved. Um, it's Sheriff, ha Sheriff Hagwood's belief that there were more than two people who were involved in the totality of the crime, including the disposal of the evidence and the abduction of the little girl. Quote, we're convinced that there are a handful of people that fit those roles who are still alive. So it remains unsolved, but investigators um, hold on to hope that Sheila, Ricky, Greg, the Sharp family, and the investigators will find justice. So anyone oh. who has any information on the Ketty murders, is at, including a counselor who works at the VA hospital, I guess, is asked <laughs> to call the Ketty murders hotline at 2836300. Wait, six, that's not a number. It's not a phone number. At one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> two okay it says two eight three zero three six oh with no area code apparently just sure just go to Kenny Ken murder hotline on google just talk to the sheriff you'll find just them. ask jeeves about it and yeah. he'll tell you where to go <laughs> anyway end of story ask sheriff jeeves well that was long he doesn't remember anything though so no i that was good that was that was a long one <sighs> but it was uh i knew there was gonna be a lot of moving you really followed it very well. So thank you for uh, helping me tell that with all the moving pieces. And Listen, thank people. God for Justin. If it weren't for Justin, Justin we really. would have not had a... That poor kid, though. Well, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. like, playing out, like, here, no, stab me here. Like... Ugh. I hope he's had a lot of therapy and been given a lot of hugs. I hope he's been had led a fulfilling, <clears throat> fulfilling hug-filled life. life. 
I hope it, he's led with uh, love and light and yes. everything. I hope everything sparks joy for Justin. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyway, thank you for watching and listening to us talk for watching, a long time. Watching, listening, experiencing. In 3D. Oh. Omnimax. <laughs> surround sound. Oh my God. Are we Dolby on someone's di- surround Dolby sound? Dolby Digital. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, okay, let's hang up. I have to be. <laughs> let's hang up. Let's, let's, uh, okay. Yeah. Close the, What's wrong with me? Close the door. You go. Okay. Thanks everyone for listening. And <laughs> and and no and oh right, stupid me. That's why we drink. Apparently. <laughs>